Hello, welcome back to the Berkeley Book Chats. I'm Stephen Best, the director of Berkeley's Townsend Center for the Humanities. For today's book chat, James Porter, professor of ancient Greek and Roman studies and chair of the Department of Rhetoric, will discuss his recent book, Homer, The Very Idea. James will be joined by two of his colleagues, Mario Tello, professor of ancient Greek and Roman studies, comparative literature and rhetoric, and Mark Griffith, the Clio Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Classical Liter Languages and Literatures. Before we begin today's conversation, I'd like to draw your attention to a few upcoming towns and events. The first event in our In Dialogue with China Art, Culture, Politics series happens next Monday, October 17th. It's a conversation with Wei Zhao and Thomas Han on the question of cultural heritage in China and whether it's an endangered species. That'll be taking place in the matrix in the social sciences building. Next Friday, October 21st at 12 noon, Margaret Guerrero and other members of UC Berkeley's Foundation Relations and Corporate Philanthropy will be hosting a development workshop on grant seeking in the arts and humanities. That event will take place online via Zoom so please go to the Townsend Center webpage to register for the event. Our next book chat will take place two weeks from today on October 26th, when we will be joined by Nicholas Matthew, a professor in the music department. Nicholas will be speaking with Alyssa Tamarkin about his recent book, The Haydn Economy, Music, Aesthetics and Commerce in the Late 18th Century. For today's book chat, Mario and Mark will begin by giving brief, brief remarks about James's book, before opening up the discussion. Mark, you can take it from here. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to chat about this really very accessible and entertaining book. One though that is also entirely, of course, cutting edge and up to date and provocative. In confronting the so-called Homeric question, I questioned about the identity or identities one Homer, two Homers, many Homers, an oral tradition of multiple Homers, the date, the place of origin, the original name, the compositional process, the career, the ignominious death of the author or authors of the Aladdin Odyssey, along with the notorious question of the historicity or otherwise of the Trojan War and of the eternally celebrated narratives of the alleged adultery of Helen and Paris Alexandros, the siege and, and sack of Bronze Age Troy, Ilium, and the protracted return home of the quasi folktale adventurer Odysseus. Jim Porter is addressing questions and answers, claims and refutations, boasts and criticisms, corrections and complaints that have been circulating ever since the earliest days of these poems' existence, and that show no sign of dying down or being resolved anytime soon, or indeed ever. The Homeric question will always be with us, it seems, and so will debates about the reality or significance of the Trojan War. Jim's book is not attempting to answer these questions one way or the other. Instead, it is examining why the questions have been so constantly addressed, why the Greeks of the archaic and classical and later ages, and also subsequently the Romans, innumerable scholars, grammarians, poets, literary critics of the Renaissance and early modern Europe, and both professional and amateur archaeologists, historians, and general readers of the present day continue to be so energetically engaged with the idea of Homer. Homer has always been a construction, as Jim argues, something we make up to suit our fashions or our needs. Whether as a sculpture or a painting or as the subject of literary biography and anecdote, hagiographic or scurrilous, or as a supposed historical source, for information about the past, Homer has been built up and torn down over and over by succeeding generations from different angles and for different purposes and agendas. Every construction is undertaken with the understanding that these two poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are universally recognized for better and for worse as the founding documents of Western literature and of ancient culture. With the understanding too, that the vividness and sweep of their narratives and speeches characterization puts that author in a unique category of talent and achievement. 
as Krishna as he represents himself in his poetry yeah. in, in direct contact with the muses and describe gods and goddesses and events and heroes of a past that lies irrevocably beyond the boundaries of the here and now, a past that is lost and yet preciously preserved or fantasized in these two supreme epic poems. As Jim says, this has always been treated as the most revered and the most reviled poet of antiquity. And his book underlines the degree to which the idea of Homer has presented to different generations an inescapable sense of trauma, of loss. It's not just that Homer is nothing, i.e. we can't find him, we can't identify who he really was and what the geography and events of the Trojan War really amounted to, or even recover the authentic relics of that era. But he is less than nothing. The harder you look, the less there is to see and to hold on to. Whether or not Homer himself was blind or even existed as a single person, the vivid scenes that these texts narrate are both immediately present and hopelessly absent or deceptive. Jim has a wonderful account, and I think we'll actually see some images um, of this in, when he talks in just a moment. A, a wonderful account of the gigantic 19th century painting in the Louvre by Ingres, depicting the apotheosis of Homer, who is shown, as Jim put it, suspended in suspended animation, existing somewhere between life and immortal afterlife with an image that's derived, it appears, from multiple sources, including previous paintings, among them Rembrandt's famous depiction of Aristotle, if it is Aristotle, contemplating the bust of Homer and ancient sculptures of Zeus and other suitably august figures, given that the ancients freely admitted that nobody had the faintest clue as to what Homer actually looked like. Likewise, discussions of Homer's real name. Was he born, was he first named Melis Igonese, Melisianax, Meli, why did he need to change his name in the first place? Uh -huh. His place of origin, Smyrna, Chios, Babylon, Egypt, ancient debates roamed and raged all over the map, as did stories of miraculous visitations to all kinds of poets, historians, and sightseers by whom a shade, visitations that might be inspiring, ludicrous, or simply confusing. The most fitting of all of Homer's representers turns out to be, I think, as I, I found as I read the book, appropriately enough, as Jim traces the story, Jorge Luis Borges, whose elusive labyrinthine, la, labyrinthine Troy is explored in chapter four, which I think Mario will be probably talking about in just a moment. I have lots of questions I'd love to ask Jim here online, but I'll keep them to a minimum now. So we'll have time to hear from him directly and so that others in the audience in due course can ask their question. Here goes. To what degree do you think this Homer phenomenon and its elements of loss, lack and trauma are unique to this poet and this specifically Greek culture? Do we find the same elements, maybe in less extreme degree, in the English obsession with Shakespeare, his family, his authentic and exactly rebuilt globe theater, his second best bed, his unreliable manuscripts and tantalizing love life, Mr. W.H. and the sonnets, even the question of authenticity overall, the Earl of Oxford. Or again, looking at England, the context I'm most familiar with, might we think of Camelot and King Arthur's lost but nostalgically imagined world of knightly chivalry, the Holy Grail, and Lancelot and Guinevere. Of course, other figures from antiquity, such as Pythagoras and Socrates or Moses, or Jesus and the Buddha come to mind as well, figures whose own words and life events are both highly uncertain and fantasized or contested in extravagant detail, and also felt to be vitally significant for thousands and millions of later followers. I'd better not mention, Prideritio here, the figure of the Prophet Muhammad and the horrible consequences of Salman Rushdie's fantasy treatment of his career and words in Surah 53. Are the Greeks and Homer then unique in their contested and conflicted attitude to a first founding literary genius or not? And maybe the last question I'll put out here. Nietzsche was the subject of Jim's first two books. Since then, Jim's published very extensively, winning prizes covering vast areas of ancient and modern literature and philosophy, especially aesthetics. I was struck by the significant place that you assign Jim to Nietzsche in this book, uh, 
both at the beginning and towards the end in your discussion of the Dionysian and Apollinian aspect of Homeric poetics, in which you focus on the constant and inescapable presence of war, violence, loss, and trauma. How important is Nietzsche to Homer? Oh. I'll stop there and hand over to Mike. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you, Jim. Um, in the last two chapters, the book displays once again Jim's distinctive ability to reconfigure the Homeric question in critical theoretical terms to convert it into a philosophical problem rather than a historical one. Yet, this philosophical discussion reads as a brilliant exercise in the art of the essay, which reminds one of Auerbach as well as Roland Barthes or Susan Sontag. The Homeric poems for Jim are a primary site for interrogating the methodological presuppositions of our continuing phantasmic bonds with antiquity, but also of interpretive work as such, that is of any cognitive affective engagement with what, for lack of a better word, we can call an object, textual or visual. It is in the chapter entitled what did Homer see that Jim addresses the paradoxes of the very idea of idea, that is, of its inescapable visual implications? How shall we resolve the apparent contradiction between, on the one hand, a poet traditionally characterized as blind, and on the other, an exceptional descriptive vividness, a capacity for panoptically capturing the real, for seeing everything and seeing it in the most pleasing fashion for the eyes and the ears of his listeners and readers. As Jim reminds us, for Plato to listen to Homer is not to see a thing, it is to be blinded by song. And for an ancient commentator, Homer grants his narrative a powerful effet de réel by blinding his readers with his vividness by denying them the opportunity, as the commentator says, to consider whether the description is true or not. Not just a compensation for his alleged disability, vividness is nothing but a capacity for inflicting or bestowing what Jim calls readerly blindness. This effect of hypermimetic dispossession, Jim surprisingly argues, is to be imputed to the fact that Homer is not the external narrator of a lost object, the heroic past embodied by the anarchivic space of Troy, but he himself is immersed in and indistinguishable from a landscape of ruination. As he beautifully puts it, like an anamorphic image, Homer's Troy is the place where all this significance gets collected and condensed, and then deflected in the Leadic narrative onto the Greek wall, which represents in its crumbling and finally vanished materiality a distorted memory of Troy. Like the protagonist of Borges's The Immortal, the readers of Homer finally see at the end of the vertiginous archaeopoetic journey they are urged to embark on in the quest for him or Troy a recalcitrant or impossible object an object that, as our host Stephen Best might put it, recoils, performs its own beautiful elimination, and ours as well. The last chapter is concerned with another paradox, why war, that has occupied critics for centuries, what we could call the relation between form and content in the Iliad. The question that troubled pre- and anti lacanian readers is, in fact, how can we enjoy the spectacle of war? The overwhelming beauty of Homeric form, its aesthetic charm, defends the reader from the horrors of the war. This was a common response. Many critics, Jim says, were all too eager to become outright apologists for Homeric violence, whether by aestheticizing the gore condoning it or sidestepping it altogether. Urging us to return to the readings of Vito, 
Nietzsche and Hauerbach, inspired by what he calls a radical disenchantment, James suggests that Homer uses beauty not to make war palatable, but to make it questionable, for Homeric epic is always also a counter epic. That is to say, it is not the attraction of a beautiful death, but rather the sheer expenditure of life in its fullest flowering that draws us to epic heroes. In other words, the waste fascinates. For me, the most powerful moment in the chapter is when Jim gently yet compellingly critiques Jean-Pierre Vernant's idea of the Iliadic beautiful death, which by idealizing the waste minimizes the lingering danger that human flesh will be annihilated by the hunger of the oppressed non-human animal. Such minimization inevitably reinscribes nationalist uses of Homer, such as the Nazi appropriations of him as a philo -Elene, critiqued by Auerbach, Simone Weil, Rachel Bespaloff, Adorno Keimer, and later Derek Walcott. The idea of the beautiful death was also used at the beginning of the pandemic by book public officials who proposed that the elderly sacrifice themselves for the common good, that is, for the forward motion of the economy. Jim's extraordinary, fearless, radical book leaves us here with the need for rejecting classically safe readings of Homer and to embrace radical disenchantment and for this we must deeply thank him so i would have a lot of questions to ask him but i think that a few things that our audience could be interested in hearing him talk about would be so can you talk a little bit about the relationship i didn't have time to talk about this the relationship between our back on the one end and nietzsche and Vic on the other and also what i mean you are also a great scholar of our book. our audience knows that so i wonder whether you could talk a little bit about how you see our book's interest in the foreground and the background how does this idea of the foreground as it, does it as it influence your idea of readerly blindness for example and i'll leave it at that for now okay thank you those are both really so stunning uh sets of inaugural comments here so I just want to thank you both uh, for agreeing to host uh, this panel and also to the Townsend Center uh, where I actually presented some of this work um, a while ago so I owe a great deal of thanks to Townsend as well and to Stephen now the new director Timothy Hampton was in charge at the time and and set up occasions where Homer and trauma could be discussed so first of all um I think I should start off um, by looking at a couple of images and I want to focus on something that connects the dots between your various comments so the this is the cover of the book and I want to focus a little bit on the notion of the idea of Homer um, that Mark began with the the cover is uh, a designer's composite image of three three different uh, sources of imagery and to, and it was a brilliant kind of uh, move on the part of the Chicago designer what we have at the top is a statue a bust of Homer from antiquity the Louvre of Homer probably from uh, sometime in the Hellenistic period then we have a drawing by Angra himself and underneath another painting which was a study also both of these the drawing and this painting underneath are this are part of a study that went into the next image which is the one that mark mentioned angra's apotheosis is called the divinity the uh, deification or apotheosis of homer what's very uh strange about this picture there's so many um things is that for me it represents a perfect romantic idealization of homer who somehow uh, occupies the center of the scene surrounded by a temple the human figures around him form a kind of temple as well with their diagonal uh, angles um, mimicking the temple behind him and Homer here is being 
anointed by some sort of divine Greek figure, and he's surrounded by all of his ancient admirers, and then the modern admirers as well. And it's this notion of uh, the question of the deification of Homer, um, that the book is, in a sense, um, both commenting on and also, in a way, knocking off of the pedestal. Let me give you an example of why. <clears throat> so Homer here, it's unclear whether he's alive already or dead? Is he being turned into a god, as Angra says, or is he just being canonized as the greatest poet in all of world history, at least in the West? Um, he's surrounded by, there, there are inscriptions above and below, and they come from the end of the contest of Homer and Hesiod, in which Homer um, actually, uh, when Homer dies in a very ignominious fashion, he slips in the mud, having failed to understand a riddle that was put to him by by fisher boys um, and he couldn't it's a they were teasing him for his blindness so one of the things that uh, astonished me when I was going through the the research <clears throat> for the book was how um, there was a tradition of deification of Homer but there was also which I call the ap apotheosis but there also was another tradition that actually mocked Homer and dragged him down uh, from his high place in culture. And the tradition of Homer throughout the ages oscillates between apotheosis and apostasy, or um, somehow a refusal to accept Homer as um, in this divinely anointed fashion. That um, this is the bust of Homer that Angra used as his model. And this is my favorite picture of Homer. We could call it the cyborg Homer. This was a study that Angra used. And you can see how his own Homer is both divine and mortal. The, the top section, the bust, it comes from a statue. Behind him is a figure of Musaeus who's whispering in his ear, some sort of inspiration. And then he himself is a live fleshly body. So we have this problem that Angra was knew about and incorporated into his painting, but also covered over in a sense. Here we find a kind of X-ray version of the entire tradition of Homer. The question uh, at issue is whether Homer is, um, oh, I need to show one more thing, whether Homer, oh, I think I didn't share the screen, did I? Oh, one second. Let me do that. I'm sorry. Now I do. Terrible. Uh, one sec. Okay. So I'll start all over very quickly. The image of the book cover, the Angra painting, which is very famous from 1827. It's a huge picture, the original statue, which of course is just an imaginary picture of Homer, the cyborg Homer. Um, and then this is another revelation, another kind of x-ray portrait of Homer, where Homer now has become the tradition itself. Uh, this, this sketch is called Antiquity on a Pedestal, and Homer represents antiquity. So it's this identification of um, Homer and antiquity. I make sure I've stopped the share. Okay, yeah. The identification of the two that is what I'm uh, interested in exploring in the book. The um, back to the question of <clears throat> the idea. So Nietzsche, in his uh, in 1869, gave an inaugural speech um, when he was made a professor. It was on the problem of Homer. He called it the personality of Homer, and he later published it as Homer and classical philology. And Homer is synonymous with classical philology. Philology was born with the problem of Homer, and it still is functioning in a kind of relationship to that unresolved problem. And Nietzsche asked whether in Homer has a person been made out of a concept or a concept out of a person. So in other words, is the idea there and then it becomes personified or, or do we have a person that's been made into, um, or do we have an idea that's made into a person or the other way around? That is uh, an idea that he gets actually from probably from Vico. I don't know for sure if he read it, but Vico was the first to announce that Homer was an idea that was created in and believed in by the Greeks. And the Trojan War was like Homer, something that never actually took place. 
So he denies the historicity of Troy. He teases us with the historicity of Homer. Homer was just simply a projection of the Greeks. And it's with that kind of uh, projection that we've been dealing with in the traditions that have come down to us today. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> I can remember what I wanted to say next. Um, the the moderns, Vico and Homer, were uh, Vico and Nietzsche were the first to um, articulate this question whether Homer was really just an idea, an idea which we could say is a fantasy, as Mario was saying. But the Greeks actually, and the ancients, knew this as well. They just simply didn't say it out loud. But you can find it in their various recreations of Homer and the Homeric problem, the question, Homeric question, who was Homer? When did he live? Did he actually exist? Uh, there's a, this question of whether Homer existed or not, said to be a kind of modern invention, a modern uh, achievement, but in fact, I think if we look at the playful fictional histories about Homer, those multiple biographies that are given to him in antiquity, he was given more lives than any person should actually have, indicates that Homer for them was also an idea that could be played with, toyed with. He's in some ways something like a Hitchcockian MacGuffin. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So the book explores the, the prehistory of the Homeric question and tries to indicate that the Greeks were not as unsophisticated as we tend to think, that they actually recognized that Homer was indeed a problem. In many ways, the ancients developed the Homeric question in a way that pre not only anticipated uh, m moderns, but also in a way um, uh, takes the rug out uh, the carpet out from under the feet of the moderns and because it they themselves um were willing to experiment with this possibility that homer just wasn't there uh, as a real person <clears throat> all right um what i let's see um mark asked a, a very good question um how unique is homer and i just like to suggest that Homer is really not like Shakespeare um, because, and, and, and he's maybe a little bit closer to Moses. Homer represents a kind of object, a lost object that never existed and was continually sought for in the years, in the centuries and millennia afterwards. Um, but um, he was never, he was never granted a, we don't have a historical figure. There's no person that we can identify as, um, as uh, um, the way we can with, with Shakespeare, for instance. Maybe Ossian would be a better comparandum, the fictional invented tradition of the Scottish uh, folks, uh, folk songs that was put together by Macpherson in the 1760s. Um, we can think of Homer as a kind of ancient invented tradition. Um, Homer really is a, uh, an impossible object. Um, he's there are lots of questions about why Homer resonated so greatly in, um, in into the centuries, and I think it's it has to do with the this, the trauma of the Trojan War itself that cannot be that makes that makes his tradition really quite unique compared to say Shakespeare. Shakespeare lived in an Elizabethan age; it was uh, less riotous and certainly not marked by the destruction of an entire civilization or conquest, which I speculate in the book, has to do with the collapse of the Bronze Age palace era, and that this dim historical memory was what kept Homer's um, significance aloft through the millennia afterwards, that when we, when audience, audiences heard Homer um, speaking, or thought they did, uh, what they actually were witnessing was this extraordinary event that happened at the end of the Bronze Age around 1200, of which Troy is just a symptom when an entire swath of cultures across the Mediterranean basin were wiped out for reasons that are completely unknown today. So in a way, Homer is tied uh, to that kind of traumatic event in the past. And um, that's what makes, I think, that's what haunts the poems and gives us an insight into the the, the way in which aesthetics and violence, the way Mario was talking about, 
um, intermingle in complicated ways. Um, now, just very quickly, and then I'll open up for conversation to the panel and then to the audience. The question keeps uh, coming up about Nietzsche and Nietzsche's role here, and maybe his connection to uh, uh, Auerbach. Um, I believe that there's a kind of unwritten um, essay that needs to be done on Auerbach's relation to Nietzsche. Um, he's, he did have a very deep understanding of Nietzsche, and he refers to him in various places. What struck me in, in looking at Auerbach's reading of um, Odysseus' Scar, the first chapter of Mimesis, is the uh, way in which he focuses on the muted violence of the both poems, the Odyssey and the Iliad, um, and how the aesthetic surfaces of, um, of, um, of Homer's descriptions actually disguise, mute, um, or divert us from the under, undergrowth of violence is that there. So when Od Odysseus, the famous scene that he analyzes in chapter one, Odysseus uh, is being exposed, revealed by the nurse, Eurycleia, who washes his feet. Um, the first act that he, the first action that Odysseus does is he grabs her by the throat and muffles her voice and throttles her. And this Auerbach marks it, marks, remarks on the violence of this particular scene. The next, uh, the next event that he describes from Homer is from the Iliad, not from the Odyssey. And again, it has to do with violence and um, uh, um, what he describes as, let me see if I can find the quotation. Um, um, <clears throat> he says, much that is terrible takes place in the Homer poems, but it seldom takes place wordlessly and yet it is also disguised. So what we find, I think there, Mario, what you were uh, looking at, you were gesturing towards the surface depth kind of uh, combination. The depth is what is hidden beneath the surface. The depth for, uh, for Auerbach would be the Dionysian violence that is suppressed by an Apollonian uh, surface phenomenon. And that Reading Auerbach in that light makes perfect sense um, as a kind of intellectual history of ideas because he slots right into a German tradition that Nietzsche was naming when he set up this distinction between um, Apollo and Dionysus, that which disguises violence and that which disturbs and disrupts underneath the surface. And the strange point that Nietzsche makes is that we are fascinated by both aspects. So yes, we need to ask questions about our own engagement what is the ethics of reading when we look at Homer and try to you know, comprehend our own attraction to something which is utterly uh, destructive? Um, so that, that would be the final uh, takeaway. If you like, that would connect up with what is the sort of this radical disenchantment that you were quoting, Mario. And that, that quotation, by the way, I owe to Rachel Bespalov. Um, but she came up with the phrase herself. And, in her essay on the Iliad, which is one of the finest pieces written next to Simone Weil's in the 20th century, during a war when, like Auerbach, she was focused on the violence of our, her time and was trying to make sense of it. And she did so by look, turning to Homer, the origins of Western civilization, which unfortunately, paradoxically, are founded on traumatic violence of some sort, um, the destruction of a city, and maybe something even greater than that, the destruction of entire civilization. So I hope that that goes a little bit. Um, I hope that covers some of the points that you were making. And I'd love to hear, you know, more reactions from you and from the audience. Yeah, I, I, if I can pick up on the idea of radical disenchantment, I, which I loved. And uh, um, well, my first question would be, um, what's your what does it mean to read the Iliad in this moment of war uh, for you? And the other question is, uh, um, do you have any other examples of how, you know, these ethics of radical disenchantment, disenchantment can help us push against some critical cliches that uh, uh, are associated with the scholarship on Homer, for example, not just the beautiful death, but for example, the idea of immortality, yes. the idea of Cleos that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to an extent, seem to be um, 
inescapable when you teach Homer, but I think that the approach that you are laying out at the end actually uh, invites us to to question them deeply. So um, yeah, that's really important. So thanks. Um, the idealization of Homer, the divinate, making him, turning him into a god, um, goes hand in hand with a certain humanistic reading of Homer, which is very typical of 20th century readings, unfortunately still is. Um, there are some exceptions. Mark Buchan is one example. Uh, and then going, he, in a way, harks back to Adorno and Marcuse, the dialectic of enlightenment, which, which is another, which begins with this concept of the, the one that the one that motive the problem that motivated all wartime writings about homer except for perhaps um uh the trojan war never took place the uh, Girardot's play um so uh so humanism and idealism it's a, a continuous uh, strand in in thinking about classics from the past and um i think it does an injustice to them in some way because uh, uh um, first of all, it ignores the critiques of violence that existed all the way through Euripides and further down, even in the contest of Homer, Homer is a, loses against uh, Homer against Hesiod uh, because he's too violent a poet, and Hesiod is the poet who represents peaceful agricultural agrarian society and and a different set of values. Um, so there's there's that, um, and then I think that it's also important that we look. Uh, consider the sophistication of Homer, the Homeric poems themselves, which um, lend themselves not necessarily to a humanistic, redemptive kind of reading, but actually an unreparative, um, uh, anti-redemptive reading, which challenges us at every moment, starting with the very first word of the poem, which is wrath, manin, um, which caused all kinds of conniptions and objections among the later grammarians who said, why did Homer start off with such a, a dubious you know, concept word, uh, wrath, um, which um, uh, because every single word in Homer is sung and is a part of song, it's impossible to disentangle the two ever. So it means for us as, as readers that we have to be constantly on our guard in a way um, I'm not saying that Homer doesn't offer some interesting, great insights into reconciliations of various sorts, but in Priam and the final scene in book 24, the poem seems to end with a kind of promise of a reconciliation, but a few days later, they go on to sack Troy, so after the promise is made. So, Mark, yeah. I just wanted to um, add one other perspective here. Please. The Gilgamesh epic you know, we know a lot more, we have more of it, we know it much better than when I was growing up. Um, the Gilgamesh epic, we actually know now the name of one of the main authors of this kind of classic version of it, uh, Sin Leki Unini. And we also have with the first line and the, or the first lines and the ending, we have a statement of what the city of Uruk, you know, look at the city of Uruk, its giant walls, its big territories, how it's all laid out. You see what Gilgamesh and his successors have achieved yeah. and have left through the sufferings and the learning processes that have gone on in the poem. So he's evolved as a leader, as a thinker, as a hero king, whatever. Um, so paradoxically, you know, we still don't know who Homer is and we have, as you've been pointing out, a poem that is hugely pessimistic. If you don't believe in immortal God, you know, heroes living on and being glorified for everyone, that that's something worth striving for. The actual achievement of Achilles, he never gets to be a king. He, he's achieved almost nothing other than killing a mass of Trojans, including a really nice, impressive family man. I mean, you know, this is trivializing it. Yeah. But the. Yeah post-colonial or the modern way of looking now at the Western achievement of obliterating or imagining the obliteration of a Troy and of these heroes from a former era. I mean, it's more like the Arthur model, a nostalgia for something that once was there, but is there. So I'm just wondering, just throwing these ideas around some more about the shift 
in focus that's gone on. And similarly with the Bible, the yes. Moses story, you know, there wasn't really a Passover. There wasn't a 40 years in the desert. Right. So most of the stories in that Moses is supposed to have authored and to have participated in didn't actually happen. It's now sort of generally agreed. That hasn't been faced in the same kind of way. Moses isn't sort of taught as a problem or the Bible as a problem text um, of something that never really. So what what does one do? You, I mean, do you have any yeah. um, comment on whether it sounds like your own response to how we should be reading the Iliad and the Odyssey would want to put it in dialogue with other yeah. sacred texts and yeah. vital sort of culturally yeah. central texts from yeah. antiquity. Yeah. So yeah, back to Achilles first. Uh, the next time we see him is in the underworld in book 11 in the Odyssey. And he's saying, you know, I would trade in anything to be a, a slave or thief or surf on the uh, living above and not as a king of the men, king of men in the underworld. So he disavows his entire, you know, in a sense, disavows his heroic um, interest. So, yeah, it's a very, it is, there is a way of reading the poems as very dark. And I think that they are haunted by a kind of trauma. And it could be too that, you know, we need to look at other traditions to find something more, uh, I don't know, uh, a different sense of what the past can mean and and a different sensibility. Although I think that Homer provides that different sensibility in his own critique of it, the yeah. critique of what he's giving. The Moses question is really interesting. Um, there was, in fact, there is a parallel tradition um, between Moses and Homer. It begins with Spinoza, not begins, but I think he's the highlight of this, where he writes his treatise on political theological treatise, in which he attacks the credibility of Homer as um, giving us a kind of revealed truth about religion, which is extraordinary for him. It ended up uh, causing him to go into exile and um, be disavowed by the Jewish community in in, Hall, in, in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, that tradition um, ran in parallel with the discrediting of Homer as the originator of the Homeric poems. It ended up with Friedrich Wolf, who made the first, you know, great, after Vico, uh, made the great um, sort of, the great philological disenchantment of Homer, if you like. And so the two, there is a even, there is even some suspicion that Vico, um, when he's writing about Homer, is trying to avoid the fate that happened to Spinoza, and that in fact it's a rubric or cover for Moses himself. So, the uh, they're intertwined in interesting ways. Ron Hendel has a really interesting uh, set of arguments about Moses and Exodus, and how this create this is also an invented tradition that's used to prop up a nation, a nation uh, that is just coming into its own. The way the Greeks became Greek once they sort of after the Persian War and elevated Homer into a kind of um, national hero as opposed to the barbarian others and so on. So the the two would be worth exploring together in, and I think that would be really fruitful uh, st a study that I haven't seen anything in detail yet uh, about that. So sure, that would be really interesting to to consider. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I have another very general question, um, I would say about the Homeric philology of the future, if you... And so, um, what kind of dissertation on Homer would you like to see, you know, in the future? So, I mean, people who are listening to us, uh, a graduate student, for example, who would like to write on Homer, so do you have any suggestions for them? Oh, that's right. Huh. Well, I think... There has been quite a bit of work on the reception of Homer. There's a lot more that needs to be done. I think it's very hard to understand Homer without looking at that continuous, you know, tradition that works on, as I said, in two different angles, buttressing and critiquing the tradition. Um, there's a, I mean, I could go into the weeds with this, you know, there's so much to be done with the origins of ancient scholiastic comments, the grammatical comments on Homer that you can actually find in Plato um, and around the age of the sophists who give rise to this um, questioning and setting up problems. And um, it we hear about it in Aristotle. So there's certainly that. 
um, more comparative, absolutely more comparative work along the lines that um, Mark was suggesting. Um, Mario, maybe you could do some sort of radical formalist reading of Homer at some point. That would be very interesting <laughs> to test out. Well, you do a very, a, an amazing one in the book with William Kentridge. I don't know whether you want to talk about that a bit. Uh, which one is that? Well, about... the amazing reading of uh, the uh, rhythm of war and the rhythm of poetry in William Kentridge. Yeah. Are you thinking about um, the, the well, f the liar of Achilles and that sort of thing or something? When you else? talk about the rhythm of the examiner and how that is really the rhythm of war. Yes. Sure. So, well, that goes hand in hand with this problem. How can we... Uh, it's the ascetic and the Dionysian, if you want right. to go to Nietzsche, are, work, collaborate. I mean, he says himself that they are co-conspirators, basically, of the Greek spirit. And we see that happening in Homer with his own you know, uh, approach to song, I suppose, and rhythm and music, uh, which is um, that by which the means by which uh, are conveyed these horrific images. And so there's a, an extraordinary dissonance between the pleasure that we get from looking at something, from hearing war being recited in a rhythmic fashion, if you like, which by itself is, you know, terribly deterritorializing for readers. I mean, what does that actually mean to take pleasure in that in that kind of affective, deep level? Um, and so maybe more work could be done along those lines. Um, song is a dangerous thing in Homer. Um, the sirens are dangerous figures, you know? They, they represent to Odysseus everything that he would love to know about, you know, the world. They can, they promise him great knowledge, which is what we hope to get from Homer, and yet they are also destructive figures. Um, so something, some sort of dissonant reading along those lines would be very useful. Um, I did discover, but I've talked about this before, even at the Townsend, that Kentridge has his own, uh, homage to the dactylic rhythms, uh, dactylic examiners of Homer, where the he's, he has a scene uh, just in which the, um, um, which the, which contains a kind of, in a palimpsestic way, a picture of dactylic rhythms, the metrical signs, which turn into javelins and strike down on the ground. It's a very powerful moment. And, uh, and seems to me to be perfectly accurate as a representation of the potential of Homeric poetry. Um, were you thinking of something else, Mark? No, I was thinking exactly of that. Like the, the voice of Homer really becomes the voice of war. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark. Mark. Just, just um, adding to that or, or inquiring a little further on that, you heard some really interesting remarks about the demotic character yeah. of Homeric narrative and sort of culture or story. And that seems to speak also to the issue of how an audience is involved. You know, the language is artificial. It's nobody's language. Yeah. The subject matter in some ways is supremely sort of aristocratic. Um, and yet there is this demotic um component or flavor that draws people i wondered if that's i mean again the hexameter perhaps the rhythm the accessibility of the rhythm and the sort of the fact that it's so standardized and available i don't know yeah. i'm i'm floundering a little bit here but um no. i wondered if you could say a little bit more about yeah. how you think that works so great um it's true Homer, the Homeric language was an artificial language. It's also a language of art. And the German term, I'm not sure if it was invented in, um, in 1921, but there's a book called the, the Homerische Kunstsprache, which is about, the, which translates into an artificial language, but also an artistic language. And it's true that there must have been, again, thinking of the dissonance, uh, that this must have caused to people listening to this both alienated Homer, made the the what he was narrating something strange and foreign and ancient and archaic and inaccessible. And uh, at the same time, within Homer's poetry, we have daily scenes from daily life contrasted with the actual epic um, activity, the actions on the 
on the battlefield. And there's another, that's another decalage, if you like, between everyday life and, you know, what seems to be happening in the recesses of the past. So probably there was a, a lack of comprehension, and a puzzlement, as well as a fascination with this gap between the two kinds of reality. It's something that Auerbach points to as well. What he finds in the in the Hebrew Bible is an attention to everyday life and to a sort of daily reality that he finds lacking in Homer, but that overlooks the fact that there are these other scenes which are very demotic and very rudimentary sort of ec the economies that farmers and shepherds and others uh, were living out in a very unheroic, unepic style. And these two levels conflict in interesting ways. Um, so we have a question from someone in the audience, which I would like to read out. So you write that Homer, this idea at the origin and heart of the Western tradition, is an impossible object that, quote, enters the cultural record as an object that is lost from the moment it is found. In that sense, does the Homeric idea share less uh, with Shakespeare and more with that which emerges at the margins of Western culture, for example, the, melan the melancholy culture of death and trauma in the Middle Passage. And so could you riff on Homer's relation, not to the centers of Western culture, but the margins, for example, Walcott's Homer? Yeah, great. That's a wonderful. So Walcott's Homer is just one of the most superb poems written in a kind of Homeric vein, but also in a way anti-Homeric. Uh, and uh, and he does do, he does exactly that. He displaces Homer to the periphery, to the colon, colonial or post-colonial per periphery. Um, and yes, it is entirely, that makes such good sense, um, this idea that the Middle Passage represents a kind of traumatic black hole that haunts the entire poem. We get scenes of Africa, in a kind of hallucinatory scenes um, that um, can, can, can conflict with what we see in the present, where we have characters who are named after Homeric characters, an Achille, a Helen, um, uh, and others uh, like that. Um, so for sure, the in particular, trying to remember his name, uh, there's one character in particular who's wounded with uh, at his ankle and it reminds us of ankle chains and it's aggravating aggravated all the way through the entire poem he's a kind of um oh mario or mark rem remind me the name of the the figure who's left behind on an island and whose bow is needed to take to philoctetes yes philoctetes or philoctet is the this character who is uh, whose wound is still festering today and it has to be cured by some sort of uh, um, uh, indigenous kind of uh, maybe combination of indigenous and African spell um, spell uh, spells and magic which finally happens at the end of the poem but that poem too is a kind of non-reparative poem it doesn't try to dismiss uh, the past it simply confronts it head on and in that way maybe reading uh, Walcott would be a good model for reading Homer in a more productive fashion. Um, how do we how do we collapse in a kind of untimely condition the past and the present and and recognize the, um, the pressures of each on each other in a way that we tend to forget when we idealize shove off into the past um, a, a remote ideal. Any any further questions? We have a few minutes left. I have a. I mean, this is probably a. Um, it reveals my deep seated, ineradicable, old style British positivism. Um, so it may be a question you should just refuse to answer. But <laughs> is, is there any discovery that could be made? Kind of now, archaeological textual whatever that would for you potentially change the picture in a really important way if we found something out about who you know how the homeric poems actually 
reach their present form, what a particular part, I mean, like this um, Sinleki Unini guy who we didn't know about, who turned out to have been the scribe who wrote, who shaped and wrote what became the kind of classic version of the old, of the Middle Babylonian Gilgamesh. We actually have an identity for that person. And we can see, because we have several Gilgameshes from different places and times, we can actually reconstruct much more accurately the processes through which the 12th book Gilgamesh epic came to be what we can now read than mm. we can for Homer. Sure. Um, is there anything, would you welcome or do you think it would make any difference? It'd be worth having if somebody could actually determine there uh -huh. was this guy who lived in Smyrna and look, we've got this text and he was bilingual and it was Luvian and, you know, I'm being facetious. Yes, no, no, yeah. Would it make a difference to you if we could explain more where it actually actually came from, where the Iliad came from? If, if that were to happen, then we would know a lot more than antiquity did. And it would still not erase the fact that antiquity was just going around guessing at yeah. various, it wasn't just, you know, Smyrna was Colophon, it was this and that. They but gave it, would, him... it wouldn't invalidate your book. Your book, no, oh, right, yeah. Right. but uh, yeah, would it be interesting? Absolutely. Um, but that would be reaching behind the back of our existing tradition in a sense. And then I don't know what it, exactly that would prove. Um, I'm but more it's, interested it's different, so, different sorts of questions than the ones you yeah. are yeah. writing about in your yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the same would be true if we could prove that Troy really was the site of a Trojan War that is described by Homer in some way, but we don't know that yet. And I don't think it would change the um, the phantasmal aura that surrounds Troy, both in Homer and elsewhere. Um, it's like that object, the, the Achaean wall, it's just um, a discrepant object that never adds up to itself. So yeah. there's no sense of true identity um, operating in the poem or in the tradition. But it is an interesting speculation. And I wonder too, if it's not a further uh, instance of the way in which we have this yearning, this inc incomparable desire to try to name Homer and figure him out. No. Um, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying that there couldn't be such a thing, but it is interesting that we want to pin it down to a person that we can identify with the first person pronoun in the, in the poems, but the poems were passed on anonymously probably for a reason. Yeah. One, one little footnote, um, yeah. Shakespeare, there are a number of people who don't think that the William Shakespeare guy with the second sure. did compose, you know, so there are other yes. possibilities yeah. for, and, and that it matters to them, that it needs to be yeah. somebody different. Um, yeah. but, that they, they share the same problem, I suppose, yeah. as we do. And, and there were, we haven't mentioned it, but there were so many, competitors to Homer, even in antiquity, Syriagos, someone I'd never heard of before I started working on this, who was said to have been the originator of the poems that Homer then stole and, and incorporated into his own. So there were these competitions about who came first and, and didn't. I see we're running out of time. Um, but we still have one minute. Mario, one last question. Well, perhaps we... Reflection. Uh, maybe something we didn't talk about is that we are so interested in who and the figurations of the subject, but as you said, the first line, the first word of the Iliad is meaning. This, the Iliad is not an Achilles, right? It's not centered around Achilles, really, even if we keep talking about Achilles, yes. but it's centered around an emotion, or let's say it, an emotional epidemic that uh, you know enwraps everyone mm -hmm. so i think it's important you know to remind ourselves that the iliad is really not you know the epic about a subject you know no. an individual but uh, about uh, a community really uh, that uh, is no longer a community of subjects because of these uh, emotional turmoil and the name itself of the title of the epic is Troy. Exactly. Not Achilles. It's not the Achilliad, it's the Absolutely, Iliad. yeah. There's your community. Maybe I'll just leave you with one quote from Adorno who says,
And those who um, imagine disasters desire them and um, something to think about. Love it. Well, thank you very much. I think we- Thank you. Thank you. Okay.